Oh, good morning, good dingo. How are you? Good morning. Yes, I'm coming. I'm coming. Yes, I know. I'm coming. Oh, good morning. It's 8.26am here at what was once sleepy Bardwell Park Station on the Campbelltown line and commuters are streaming in to catch trains to the city. Within the next half an hour, virtually every unrestricted parking space within hundreds of metres of the station will have been taken up. A few short years ago, you could have fired a shotgun round this free car park 450 metres from the station and not hit anything, but not anymore. It's the same all over Sydney and the big leap came way back in 2004 when petrol passed 90 cents a litre. Sydney's peak period trains are almost bursting at the seams. Our most important public transport system is at capacity. You might ask, why don't they just lay on more trains? The fact is, it's almost impossible. So what happened? What's gone wrong? Conventional crude oil production peaked around 2006. The vastly more expensive deep water and unconventional crude is expected to decline from 2016. Petrol is becoming more and more expensive. The age of cheap motoring is over. Starting a century ago, vehicle kilometres travelled, or VKT, per person climbed steadily, but the ever upward trajectory began faltering around 1990. Australians are getting out of their cars, and 2004 when petrol passed 90 cents a litre, was the turning point. In 2004, VKT per person began a historic decline. It's now back to 1993 levels. It's important to note that this trend set in a full four years before the GFC. Total car passenger kilometres have been flatlining for eight long years. The only thing stopping total VKT from declining sharply as has occurred in the US, is the mining boom and population increase. So Australians are turning back to public transport in a very big way. Since 2004, our biggest capital cities have registered extraordinary annual increases in rail patronage, but Sydney, with the best suburban rail system in Australia, is the standout exception. But here's the problem. Our suburban rail system is focused on the CBD, but there are only two rail tracks across the Harbour Bridge and they can only carry 24 trains an hour in either direction. Sydney desperately needs two more tracks south from St Leonard's across the harbour and under the CBD. Just two more tracks will clear the choke point. With those two tracks we can increase rail services right across Sydney by 50%. The city rail system, which now carries a million passengers a day, could carry half a million more. But to understand why this problem exists at all, we need to step back in time. Sydney's splendid suburban rail system is very much the result of one man's vision. In the early years of last century, Dr John Job Crew Bradfield seized an historic window of opportunity denied to most of the older global cities. 
he saw we could bring our heavy suburban rail straight into and through the central business district. The result was the City Circle, finally completed in 1956, and the Harbour Bridge, which opened in 1932. The bridge originally had four rail tracks, the two that remain on the western side and two over here on the eastern side. The eastern tracks carried trams that terminated at Wynyard, but it was envisaged that they would eventually be used by heavy rail serving the North Shore and the Northern Beaches. The eastern track tunnels to Wynyard, seen here, still exist. Their entrance is bricked up beneath the later structure carrying the Carl Expressway. There are three possible ways to get extra rail tracks across the harbour. On the deck of the bridge, on a new platform slung under the deck of the bridge, or in a tunnel. In the energy poor future, we'll probably need all three solutions. The problem with a tunnel isn't just the big price tag. Unlike road traffic, rail needs very flat gradients, so a rail tunnel has to start descending a long way back from the harbour. That in turn makes it very difficult to insert any new stations. Reclaiming the bridge's eastern lanes for rail would avoid both those problems. It's the cheapest, quickest, simplest solution. Here's how the choke point can be cleared for a reasonable price. There's space in the existing rail easement for two extra tracks from Chaswood to St Leonard's. From St Leonard's, new tracks would reach North Sydney Station in Tunnel. The new tunnels would connect to North Sydney Station using the existing stub tunnels that were left for the never built Northern Beaches line. From North Sydney Station, the tracks would pass over the Bradfield Highway to the reclaimed eastern lanes by a bridge in a similar location to the original Eastern Tracks Bridge. There'd be two new Milsons Point platforms across the highway from and connected to the existing Milsons Point station. Two rail tracks would be restored on the eastern lanes of the bridge and these would reach Wynyard Station by the now unused original rail tunnels. At Wynyard, the restored tracks would use the platforms that were once used by trams but were always intended for eventual heavy rail use. From Wynyard, the tracks would descend to the reserved rail corridor under Pitt Street. Here, there are issues with tunnelling under existing buildings, but these pale into insignificance beside the complexity, cost and risk of an under-harbour solution. As the tunnel made its way towards Central, there's the possibility of a new station at World Square. At Central, the new tracks might make use of the Ghost Platforms 26 and 27, or new platforms beneath the intercity platforms. South of Central, the through city line would split with one route in tunnel to new stations at Sydney University and Prince Alfred Hospital. This route would surface to join the main western line near Stanmore. The other route would proceed in tunnel to the ghost platforms at Redfern, surface near Macdonaldtown and head down two new surface tracks from Erskineville through St Peter's to Sydenham. So if rail reclaims the two eastern lanes of the bridge, what will happen to the cars? With commuters desperate to switch to public transport, every extra train load crossing the bridge will remove around 10 single lane kilometres of traffic from the Bradfield Highway. That's like a line of traffic stretching from Lane Cove to the CBD. And that's just one train. Imagine how an extra 24 trains an hour would cut road traffic. Two more tracks will remove more than two lanes of traffic. 
The 50% capacity boost two more tracks will unleash means, for example, a suburban station with four trains an hour could have six trains, one every 10 minutes. And the price tag? Well, if we're guided by the actual cost of comparable recent projects here and overseas, rather than insanely inflated estimates from New South Wales Treasury and greedy consultants who stand to gain from the projects they price, we should be looking at under three billion. That's a small price for unlocking 50% more capacity in the city rail system. With the price of energy rising relentlessly, it's a public transport boost we need right now.